All right. Well, we're moving into Chapter 32, which is a very large presentation as well, so I've decided to break it up into two parts. Um, part 1 will be most of the psychiatric disorders, and Part 2 will be most of the substance abuse. You know, because the mind is, is such a complicated organ, and, and, and we know very little about it, um, you know, if, if you don't have some form of uh, piece or small part of a psychiatric disorder, you probably know somebody who does. Uh, that's how prevalent it is in today's society as we learn more and more about how the brain works. Um, so we're going to first start talking about behavior. And behavior is, is uh, um, defined as a person's observable activities. And we often categorize behavior as being normal or abnormal. And I often ask myself, what, what's abnormal? Well, abnormal would be out of the norm for my expectation in society. Uh, and each of us have different expectations. So while some of you may think you're normal, uh, others with different expectations may think you're abnormal. Uh, it's also based on uh, religious and cultural factors as well. And <clears throat> when you have a identifiable, obviously abnormal behavior uh, that is affecting your life functions in any society, um, then that's often coined as a, a psychiatric disorder. Now, a behavioral emergency occurs then when uh, the actions or the ideation of the individual become harmful or potentially harmful to themselves or others. And this is usually in those patients who've been diagnosed and may have been given medications, whether they be antidepressants uh, <coughs> or other medications um, to help with their diagnoses, and they uh, quit taking their medications. Uh, or they don't have, uh, you know, they don't refill their prescription because of money or those sort of things. And as a result, um, their um, uh, psychiatric disorder becomes a behavioral emergency. And the symptoms vary widely depending on the type of behavioral, um, abnormal behavior or psychiatric disorder that a person has. Uh, psychotherapy or psychopathology is the study of the origin, the development, and the manifestation of mental or behavioral disorders. Um, and it includes psychosocial factors, um, life events that you go through that affect your emotional state. Uh, and psychosocial factors are only a small part of the picture of psychopathology. Um, you know, when we talk about life events that affect your emotional state, um, this is so true in uh, EMS where uh, you'll be responding to calls that certainly may be considered a critical incident. And uh, critical incident stress is something that uh, certainly is a, a real thing. And uh, uh, in the world of psychology, if, if not managed properly, uh, can turn into uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so life events uh, that affect your emotional state are part of this. And then developmental factors, uh, how you developed as a child into adulthood and the things that you experienced both uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and they may predispose you uh, to uh, some sort of psychiatric disorder. Now, <clears throat> the control of behavior uh, is in the limbic system, which is located in the uh, inside the, uh, the center of the brain, attached to the brain stem. Uh, it controls motivation, it controls emotion. Uh, the limbic node is where neurons encircle the inner structures of the limbic system and the innermost layer of the cerebral cortex. And within the limbic system is the thalamus. And the thalamus is your brain's switchboard. Uh, the hippocampi uh, is where you process and consolidate long-term memory. Uh, and you uh, filter incoming sensory inform information to determine whether that uh, sensory information is, is dangerous. Uh, and um, if the information that you're receiving is perceived to be important, then you commit that to memory. The amygdala is the brain's emotional sentinels, and uh, they attach emotional significance to the stimuli that's passing uh, through the uh, hippocampi. 
Uh, the hypothalamus is the bridge between the nervous and the endocrine systems. Uh, it takes care of all your housekeeping functions like regulating your uh, blood pressure, conserving water, uh, your, your, um, your thirst mechanism, maintaining your body temperature, uh, controls your hunger responses, and uh, also your physiologic response uh, to different emotions. And here's just a picture of that uh, limbic system uh, within the cerebral cortex. And you can see there then where the, um, the amygdala is and where the hippocampus is and where the thalamus and the hypothalamus is. And um, the olfactory bulb uh, is part of that as well. Now, there are some organic causes or other conditions that may show psychiatric symptoms but aren't psychiatric diseases. As an example, uh, Alzheimer's disease, a person with advanced stages of Alzheimer's uh, certainly can appear to be a, a psychiatric patient, as well as somebody who has any sort of swelling inside the brain as a result of an abscess or a, or a tumor or a head injury. Uh, we know that hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia can make a patient um, seem like they have some sort of psychiatric disorder. Uh, dehydration, hypoxia, hypothermia, uh, substance intoxication, particularly with alcohol uh, or opioids or sedatives, and then withdrawal to substances as well, and stroke is another one. Um, some people are just genetically predispositioned to mental illness. And I think that's important that we understand that when a person has been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder, that it is that. It is a mental illness, just like um, diabetes is an illness, just like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is an illness. Uh, when a person has a psychiatric disorder, uh, it's not made up. It's not something that, um, you know, is fake. It's a, it's a genuine disease process. And if they manage their disease, uh, you never know that they have a psychiatric disorder. It's just that when they are unable to manage their disease appropriately is where we end up getting called. Now, there are biochemical factors as well to mental illness. Um, here we're talking about uh, relative imbalances in neurotransmitters. Um, in your brain, which include the primary neurotransmitters, uh, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Um, norepinephrine is, um, is important uh, for um, a clear thought. Uh, dopamine is important for problem solving, uh, and serotonin kind of uh, keeps things uh, mellow. Um, and when you have uh, uh, imbalances in these particular neurotransmitters, uh, we see things like anxiety uh, disorders and, and those sort of things. Now there are medications that certainly can help uh, relieve the symptoms of, of this problem. Uh, one of the first generations um, uh, medications was MAOI inhibitors or MAOIs monoaxine oxidative is a big word for it, but MAOI inhibitor, M MAOI, the I stands for inhibitors, MAO inhibitors. Um, they came out in the 1950s. They're a first generation. They're an older drug. There aren't many people on them. Uh, they have some really bad side effects. Um, they include medications like Revival. Uh, and then um, came the SSRIs, the serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And they included drugs like Paxil or Zoloft or Prozac or Celexa or Luvox. And these were all drugs that helped uh, balance the serotonin levels uh, in the brain. And then um, uh, within the last decade, uh, SSNRIs became available. And those were selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors that would help uh, balance the serotonin and norepinephrine levels. Uh, in the in the brain, and that drug is called Cymbalta. Um, <clears throat> the biophysiosocial concept related to psychiatric disorders—it's a general model or approach that states that, in addition to 
biological, um, there, are so, there are also psychological and social factors that all work together to play a significant role in how you function uh, in the context of your disease or your illness. Um, so biological makeup, behavior, the surroundings uh, that you're in, uh, how you interact and how you handle your disease or your illness in general uh, is part of this biopsychosocial concept. Um, when responding to a patient with an emergency, uh, a behavioral emergency, uh, when you respond, uh, certainly it's important to make sure that we uh, consider uh, scene safety. Um, not all patients will escalate to violence when they have a behavioral emergency, but that certainly is a, a potential. So it's very important that we have police available, uh, that we observe the surroundings and living conditions that might give us an idea of their mental state. Uh, you approach the residents from the side, not straight on the door. Um, you listen before you knock. Um, you look for signs of violence, uh, you know, things, uh, furniture that's tipped over, things that are broken on the floor, um, holes in the wall, uh, you know, things that would indicate there have been some violent outbreaks. Uh, but remember that when dealing with a patient with a behavioral emergency, if they've got a diagnosed psychiatric disorder, uh, they have mental illness and that is a disease. And as a responder, you're a patient advocate. Um, it's your responsibility to treat that patient like you would any patient who has a disease. Um, in your contact and interview of the pa patient with a behavioral emergency, uh, it's important that you, you pay particular attention to the patient's actions, the patient's behavior, to include their posture, the tone of their voice, um, the volume of their, of their voice, and the cadence of their voice, as well as their facial expressions and, and body language. You try to read the patient to see whether they're in a, in a condition um, where they're building up all this energy uh, and they're escalating to a point where they need to uh, release all that energy. Um, and it's important too that in, in, in your response to the patient that you, um, uh, you have a awareness of uh, the tone of your voice, the cadence of your voice, uh, your facial expressions and body language so that you don't appear to be threatening or you don't appear to be um, unconcerned or, or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, if threatened, leave the uh, area immediately. Uh, that's why when you go into a situation where you're dealing with a person with a behavioral emergency, you always want to have an escape route. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you can't get out quickly. Um, Life-threatening problems are a priority with behavioral emergencies as they are with any emergencies and require you to manage the ABCs. Um, watch your self-positioning again, how you position yourself. Um, there's a particular stance that a person should consider uh, rather than uh, feet shoulder width apart facing the person square. Uh, you might pull one foot back behind you a little and, and face them uh, kind of at the side so that you're not square up with them, which, which many people find to be an, uh, you know, a defensive uh, argumentative position. And you think about it, you know, if you stand next to a person, uh, you can talk a lot longer to them and with them than if you stand square up face to face. Um, Use a quiet, non-threatening tone. Let them know that you're here to help and attempt to gain trust from the patient. You want to get a history of their present illness and, and ask open-ended questions so that they can explain uh, their condition, their situation, what's going on. You want to get a primary complaint out of them and that certainly can be challenging, uh, particularly if they're manipulators. Um, you know, we've had mental health patients that are very manipulative in uh, getting what they want uh, or in replaying this broken record over and over and over again and not getting anywhere in the uh, assessment or treatment of the patient. Uh, so at some point you may have to um, you know, set some, um, some rules or some, uh, you know, give them some orders to comply with. 
Uh, you want to determine their primary complaint, get a good set of vital signs. Uh, they may have both a medical condition and a behavioral condition. And uh, certainly in patients who become agitated and extremely worked up, if they've got some sort of heart history, it may exacerbate that as well. Uh, if you can get a past psychiatric history from those patients, uh, that would be important. Uh, determine their allergies and medications, um, what sort of psychiatric disorders they have, have they been taking their medications, have they ever been hospitalized with it, um, you know, those sort of things. Uh, you know, how does the patient appear is important in your assessment. Um, are they agitated? Do they have a lot of excessive motor activity, illustrating from inner tension that's building up and up and up? You know, they may start wringing their hands. They may increase the tone of their voice. Uh, they may, their muscles may tighten up. Uh, they may start walking and pacing as they um, get ready to escalate. Um, and, you know, is the patient wearing appropriate clothing for the season, uh, and are they appropriately groomed? Um, your mental state examination will also include speech and the form of thought. Uh, are they able to process the information, understand the questions that you're uh, talking to them to create a logical flow? Um, does their speech, um, is it logical? Does it flow? Um, they may not speak at all. Uh, they may have uh, poverty of speech, a uh, very limited amount of speech. Uh, they may be blocking out thoughts, not wanting to uh, think about uh, things that are occurring around them. Um, they may have pressured speech uh, in which their thoughts are just racing. Um, they may present with circumstantial thinking, with it, which is where um, they take a lot of detours and they add a lot of extra details to kind of um, fill in the blanks and and to uh, um, maybe not necessarily focus on the problem at hand. Um, tangential or tangential, tangential thinking. Um, that's where their thinking is off topic, um, uh, never to return. So they get off the topic that you're trying to discuss and don't want to come back there. A uh, flight of ideas, that's where they m rapidly move from one topic to the next topic with no cl uh, clear transition or reason. Uh, and then they, they may just talk in word, what they call word salad, which are words, but they lack any sort of coherent pattern. Um, the thought content, um, psychosis. Psychosis, by definition, is a highly distorted perception of reality. Uh, patients who are psychotic can be suicidal, they can have homicidal ideations, uh, they can be preoccupied with both suicide and homicide, uh, they may hallucinate. Um, delusions, delusions are a false perception of situations and events believed to be true. There can be paranoia, paranoid delusions uh, where somebody's out to get me. Uh, they can be grandiose delusions where they're the most important person in the uh, room and everything is grand. Uh, they can be somatic delusions uh, where they actually have a physical defect uh, or a medical condition. And then delusions of reference. Um, preoccupations um, in thought content. Uh, Preoccupations, when you're preoccupied with a particular thought, then topics and ideas uh, consistently and constantly return to that, that one thought and, and that situation or issue dominates your thoughts. Or they could have a depersonalization where there's a detachment or estrangement uh, from their self with the situation. Uh, or a uh, derealization where the external world is strange and it's not real. Um, delirium. Delirium is uh, different from dementia in the sense that it's a clouding of consciousness. It's, a, it's usually a rapid onset of this confusion. And there are both causes inside the head and outside the head that can be um, accounted for that are causing the delirium. 
And if you fix those intracranial, extracranial causes, then the delirium goes away. So the delirium is reversible. Dementia, on the other hand, is not reversible. Uh, dementia is defined as uh, memory loss with at least one cognitive deficit. And um, this increases over time. And it's very common as we age. Um, <coughs> excuse me. As far as uh, emotion, affect, and mood, the affect is, um, you know, <coughs> how the patient is um, responding to the world around him. Um, do they feel stable? Uh, are they acting appropriately? Um, <coughs> or uh, are they acting at, with great intensity? Are they labile? Uh, labile is, uh, it means mood swings from one extreme to the other. Or their affect could be flat, where they have and show no emotion related to the things that are occurring around them. Uh, it could be constricted, um, very little affect, um, or it could be intense, uh, where again they're very uh, hyperactive. Uh, mood is a dominant, sustained emotional state, and uh, mood can be steady. Uh, with changes over a course of days. Um, as far as orientation, memory, and attention goes, uh, you can determine that by asking them, certainly, are they oriented to person, place, time, and event? So if they're alert, alert, alert and wait, <laughs> alert, awake, and oriented times four, then they are uh, alert, awake, and oriented to person, place, time, and event. As far as memory and attention, uh, you can test uh, their memory uh, certainly by asking them things like their birth date uh, or their address. Um, when assessing for substance abuse as part of a behavioral emergency, your questions need to be direct. Um, uh, just honest, direct, ask them the question, particularly if you smell something on their breath like alcohol. Uh, if you see needle marks on their arms, um, you know, be direct in questioning. Schizophrenia is a, um, certainly a psychiatric uh, disorder. Uh, it's a set of conditions with positive and negative symptoms. Um, uh, when they are psychotic, the symptoms are uh, positive. Uh, the thought disorder, the symptoms are positive. Um, but uh, when negative, when their thoughts are negative, um, they have a sharp decrease in interactions with uh, others. Schizophrenia can also be defined as paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, this is positive symptoms are very dominant. They have frequent hallucinations. They have delusions of, of, of uh, persecution. They believe that uh, somebody's out to get them. Um, they could be disorganized schizophrenia. Uh, it's extreme disorders of thought, a very disorganized speech, a severe social impairment, uh, and it can be a catonic, uh, catatonic uh, schizophrenia, where um, uh, there is no um, speech, there is no symptoms, there uh, are just movement disorders. Um, schizophrenia, as far as how it occurs, um, there are people that are genetically predisposed to having schizophrenia. Uh, it's the result of excess dopamine in the brain uh, and uh, can all be seen with brain abnormalities. Uh, as far as the epidemiology and demographics of schizophrenia, uh, about one in every 100 adults worldwide is schizophrenic. It is more severe in men uh, who show it uh, early onset, uh, typically in people with lower socioeconomic status. Um, blacks are two times uh, more likely than the general population to be schizophrenic. Um, it comes in stages as far as uh, schizophrenia goes. Uh, in the first stage, um, there's a slow increase in social withdrawal, poor communication, uh, inappropriate affect, uh, neglect of hygiene and grooming, uh, a sharp decrease in cognitive ability. And during the second stage, um, there may be a, a major event that sets it off, um, which would be the precursor to the active stage. Uh, they have all the classic symptoms of uh, schizophrenia and may require hospitalizations. And in the third stage, their symptoms uh, subside. 
uh, and it may be naturally or it may be uh, with uh, medications. Some differential diagnosis that might look like schizophrenia include Addison's disease, alcohol intoxication, bipolar disorder, brain abscess, uh, a brief psychotic disorder, cocaine intoxication, depression, encephalopathy, head trauma, uh, Huntington's disease, hypoglycemia, hypokalemia, hypothyroidism, PCP intoxication, uh, schizoactive disorder, uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, so there's so many different things that can mimic or look like schizophrenia that um, it's, 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 it's not something that we would diagnose uh, in the field, uh, but certainly uh, we would try to rule some of these other diagnoses out um, if a person presented uh, schizophrenic. Uh, therapeutic interventions, you want to assess and treat their suicidal and, and homicidal ideations. Uh, you want to calm uh, the violence. Um, you want to distress the uh, psychotic episodes, uh, transport them to the facility with the patient's previous records, uh, and for the patient and the family, uh, explain that the hallucins and hallucinations and the delusions are part of the disorder and that they are not real. A tardive dyskinesia uh, is a degenerative neurologic disorder. Uh, where you end up with repetitive movements of the mouse and uh, excuse me mouth and face uh, and some rocking, so the patient may rock back and forth. They may have ticks or um, repetitive movements of the mouth and twitching in the face. Um, the etiology it's believed to be caused by a dopamine pathway suppression in the brain by antipsychotic drugs over a long-term use. Uh, the epidemiology and demographics, 15 to 30 percent of uh, antipsychotic drug users will develop the tardive dyskinesia. Uh, it occurs primarily in older women and blacks. Uh, the history and physical findings include um, repetitive involuntary motions of facial muscles and extremities. They just twitch. Um, they're fine, they're talking to you, and all of a sudden they have this, um, this um, whole body muscle twitch uh, or facial tics or twitches. Uh, differential diagnosis, uh, it may resemble a dystonic reaction, uh, it may uh, look somewhat like Parkinson's disease uh, or certainly even be mistaken as a seizure disorder. Um, therapeutic interventions uh, is to lower the dose of the antipsychotic that they're taking and um, there is no cure for it as well. As far as patient and family education, uh, understand that these patients are at risk of falls. Um, you don't want to alter their dose without prescribing a physician's permission. And if they abruptly quit their antipsychotic med medication, uh, that certainly can cause them to return to their rapid psychotic symptoms that they were placed on the medication for to begin with. Now, there's a variety of different mood disorders. Uh, major depression and dysthymia. Um, uh, there are, uh, as far as description and definition of major depression, uh, there is uh, dysphoria or uh, melancholy. Uh, there's also um, dysrhythmia. Um, I think that was supposed to be dysthymia. Um, the etiology is uh, different severities of the same disease. It could be related to serotonin alterations, uh, an increase in limbic system activity, uh, or so, some sort of psychosocial event. Okay, could you pause? Let me pause one moment. Okay, sorry for the little uh, disturbance there. I'm actually uh, in a hotel in Des Moines. Uh, getting ready to um, uh, do a wedding and um, housekeeping wanted to come in and bother me so I had to tell him I'm busy. Uh, so going on with uh, major mood disorders um, we're going to move to the next slide uh, which include uh, major, major depression and, and dysthymia. 
Uh, as far as the epidemiology and demographics, uh, major depression is probably the most common mental illness that's out there. Uh, women are um, twice as frequent as men to suffer from major depression. Um, if it's in the immediate family, uh, there's a 1.5 to 3 times more likely to develop it. So if you've got a um, certainly a sibling that suffers from major depression, then you're uh, 1.5 to 3 times more likely to develop it yourself. Uh, certainly higher rates in, uh, uh, in, in patients who are um, uh, high use of alcohol and substances. Uh, and 8%, uh, the depression may be so severe that they attempt suicide. As far as your history and physical findings with uh, major depression, um, common tasks are very difficult to do. Uh, the limbic system, the hypothalamus uh, dysfunction, and uh, cause major homeostasis disruptions. Uh, there's sleeplessness, there's appetite changes, uh, certainly libido and, and social interaction are lost. Um, they're fatigued, tired, unmotivated, body aches and pains. Um, they just don't even want to get out of bed. Uh, differential diagnosis, uh, certainly since alcohol and drug abuse is um, uh, a cause of major depression, alcoholism might be one of the differentials. Uh, anemia, if a person is uh, anemic and not um, um, pr uh, producing enough red cells uh, and not able to carry oxygen to all their tissues, they're going to be tired. Uh, anorexia, uh, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders, bulimia, uh, certainly anorexia and bulimia both have to do with not getting enough uh, calories, not getting enough food, not having enough um, uh, energy to, uh, and so being constantly uh, tired would be common. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, Cushing syndrome, uh, dissociative disorders, uh, dysrhythmia, um, Graves disease, hypercalcemia, hyperthyroidism, hypochondriasis, uh, that would be hypochondriac, uh, hypoglycemia, and hypothyroidism. Um, some other differential diagnosis. Uh, look at the list of diagnoses for this. I mean, it's you know 40, 50 different types of conditions uh, certainly could mimic major depression. Uh, insomnia, Lyme's disease, marijuana abuse, menopause, obsessive compulsive disorder, personality disorders, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, somatoform disorder, syphilis, uh, systemic lupus, uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, as far as as far as the um, therapeutic interventions for major depression uh, is to be supportive and to transport for evaluation. Uh, if they are suicidal, certainly uh, contact uh, medical direction or, or follow uh, your protocols. Um, you know, do, don't perform an in-depth psychiatric interview with these patients who have major depression. Um, one, we're not psychoanalysts, and uh, uh, certainly we may say something to them that, um, you know, could throw them off. Uh, antidepressants is typically what they're placed on, whether they be uh, monamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, they may be put on a second generation antidepressant, which would be tricyclic antidepressants, uh, or the third and fourth generation antidepressants, which include your SSRIs and your SSNRIs. As far as uh, patient family education, uh, suicide watch, uh, certainly uh, make sure the family understands that uh, this is a serious condition and uh, they're more prone to, um, to suicide. Bipolar disorder and uh, cyclothymia. Um, uh, bipolar, as it reflects uh, two poles, um, a person may be hypomanic, where they have a uh, overwhelming sense of well-being and confidence. Uh, their mind moves very quickly, um, but they do suffer poor judgment and distractibility uh, during the hypomanic stage. Um, uh, they may be awake for days on end. Um, 
you know I I know people who who have bipolar disease and and we're in this when they're in this uh, hypomania uh, you know they kid about all the stuff that they can get done because they're just uh, their mind moves so quickly they just have this o overwhelming sense of well-being and it's a place where they like to be I mean they just feel so good about their self they have all this energy they don't need any sleep but you can imagine after three days of this uh, then they go to the other pole which is the depression um, in the manic stage uh, their self-worth is dangerously inflated uh, they suffer grandiose of delusions uh, they have the elevated mood the limitless energy uh, but their judgment is impaired, and as a result, um, you know, they are at risk of making some irrational decisions. Um, in the depression stage of bipolarism, um, then they have uh, guilt, worthlessness, lots of depression, uh, and suicidal ideations. Uh, in bipolar one shifts from melancholy to mania in mixed episodes uh, and bipolar two is the depression state of it um, mood elevation stops and um, uh, they get really depressed cyclothymia is less severe uh, they have hypomania periods and depression periods uh, but they're shorter and they're more frequent uh, the etiology is uh, the brain neurotransmitter level and receptor changes they believe cause the bipolar disorder um, as a result of significant structural changes to the limbic system as well um, women are more likely for rapid cycling um, and bi bipolar 2 is more frequently in women um, as far as the history and physical findings of bipolar disease uh, Manic episode is the defining symptom. Uh, lack of sleep, uh, elevated mood for one week, uh, rush, pressured speech, loss of rationality or control, and substance abuse. Some differential diagnosis for bipolar disorder include uh, anxiety, uh, Cushing syndrome, head trauma, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, PTSD, schizoactive, uh, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, cancer, neurosyphilis, epilepsy, AIDS, multiple sclerosis, and medication effects. Some other differential diagnoses include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, multiple personality disorder, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, alcohol abuse or withdrawal, stimulant abuse or withdrawal, uh, hallucinogen abuse, opiate abuse, uh, or withdrawal of opiates. Therapeutic interventions. Uh, many people who uh, are bipolar take lithium, and um, they may be suffering from lithium toxicity. That's a possibility. Um, so you'll do your um, initial uh, assessments and document your findings, secure IV access, monitor the ECG, and uh, rapid transport. Um, as, uh, as far as patient and family education, uh, it's important to note that um, you know during their manic episode um, where they're irrationally thinking they don't mean what they say anxiety disorders um, anxiety disorders um, could be or could manifest uh, with fear uh, physical and an emotional reaction to a real or a perceived threat uh, they could suffer from anxiety which is apprehension and worry about real or perceived threats uh, and then panic attacks which is are, are, are a sudden paralyzing anxiety reaction um, some script descriptions and definition of anxiety disorders uh, certainly any sort of phobia which would be an inter uh, intense fear uh, of an object or a given situation you know you have uh, uh, agoraphobics people who are afraid to go out in crowds uh, so there's a lot of different phobias out there, but that would be an intense fear of, of a situation or an intense fear of a, uh, an object. Arachnophobia, fear of a spider. Um, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, uh, if it, it certainly is not controlled, 
if it's not identified, if it's not controlled, um, can lead to problems, and it's usually the result of prolonged stress. Uh, PTSD uh, is uh, an anxiety disorder that occurs after witnessing, witnessing something uh, terrible, and as I had mentioned earlier, certainly in EMS, uh, we will be witness to things that are, are horribly wrong and, and bad and terrible, and, and uh, as a result, if we don't treat that uh, exposure to that event properly, we can develop PTSD. Uh, and then obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Uh, these are people who are obsessed with something. Um, they have uh, compulsion to, uh, to do something, and it's believed to be the result of a serotonin deficiency. As far as etiology goes, uh, mark hyperactivity in the pons region, controlling sympathetic stimulation. So there's an overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight nervous system. As far as the epidemiology and demographics go, 25% of Americans may have some sort of anxiety uh, during their lifetime. Uh, and uh, there is a direct relation uh, to anxiety disorders that's also tied to depression. People who are depressed uh, may often have periods of uh, intense anxiety. Uh, panic attack is a paralyzing terror. The patient gets chest pain, short of breath, sick to their stomach, lightheadedness, dizzy, uh, extreme det detachment from the environment. Uh, they hyperventilate. Uh, their heart rate is really fast. Um, as far as phobias go, um, uh, patients become extremely ang anxious whenever they're around whatever it is they fear, uh, and they may avoid it altogether. Uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, this is something that may show up days or months after a particular event. Uh, differential diagnoses uh, for anxiety disorders are long as well. There are so many different things that uh, could uh, mimic an anxiety disorder. Addison's disease, uh, alcohol intoxication or withdrawal, anaphylaxis, anorexia nervosa, a severe asthma attack, uh, marijuana intoxication or withdrawal. A conversion disorder, major depression disorders, diabetes, particularly low blood glucose, uh, digitalis, encephalopathy, um, fictitious disorder, fibromyalgia, hallucination with intoxication, uh, hallucination, intoxication or withdrawal, malingering, meningitis, personality disorders, or autism spectrum disorders. Uh, some other differential diagnoses for anxiety might be a pulmonary embolus because of how anxious a person gets when they can't breathe, Schizoph schizophrenia, somatoform disorders, stimulant intoxication or withdrawal, unstable angina or shock. Therapeutic interventions. Um, the somatic symptoms must be investigated fully. You try to calm the patient, remove the external stimuli, make eye contact, reassure them that everything's going to be okay. Uh, you may attempt to give them oxygen. A uh, medical director certainly may authorize you to give something like a benzodiazepine, whether it be Valium or Ativan, um, uh, to uh, calm these patients down. Uh, it's not typical that we're going to give them an SSRI uh, in the pre-hospital environment, but certainly if they're diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, they're more likely going to be put on an SSRI. As far as patient and family education goes, it's important to let people know that, uh, or let the patient and the family know, that the patient has little control over these symptoms when they do occur, and that it is a legitimate uh, disorder. Uh, it is a disease, uh, and when it does occur, they have no control over the symptoms. Somatoform disorders, um, that's when you have a preoccupation with your body. Uh, there's conversion disorder, where you convert um, psychological stress into pseudo-neurological symptoms, um, like hypochondriasis, hypochondriac. Uh, it's a person who's preoccupied with having a serious or mental, uh, uh, serious medical disease. Um, somatization disorder uh, occurs when a patient has multiple reoccurring complaints resulting in medical treatment uh, or an impairment of life functioning. 
Uh, in other words, uh, they can't function in life because they're constantly complaining of these uh, medical treatments that they need or these uh, pain in their abdomen, uh, pain somewhere else. So if you've got pain in four plus different sites, uh, two plus uh, GI symptoms other than pain, one plus sexual reproductive system other than pain, and one plus neurological symptom other than pain, uh, you might be suffering from this. Um, with the uh, conversion disorder, um, it's a protective mechanism to shield yourself from emotional trauma and pain. And with uh, hypochondriacs, it's a failed attempt to cope with a psychological need. Um, as far as epidemiology and demographics go, uh, women um, are more prone to somatoform disorders, uh, except uh, hypochondriacs. Uh, history and physical findings, you might have some motor sensory nervous deficits as well. Differential diagnosis for these, again, are wide and, 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 and uh, very difficult to diagnose in the field. Uh, they may be suffering from a generalized anxiety disorder or from major depression or a stroke or an ischemic attack, uh, fictitious disorders, substance intoxication or withdrawal. Uh, there are hundreds of medical conditions that could uh, cause these same sort of um, complaints. Uh, fictitious disorder and malingering. Um, fictitious disorder and malingering is intentionally producing signs and symptoms to assume the role of a sick patient. Uh, it's called Munchausen syndrome, uh, where a person makes up these signs and symptoms uh, so that they can have surgeries or they can be hospitalized or they can get a lot of um, um, oh, sympathy and, and um, support from uh, their family and their friends. Um, it requires the person to be medically knowledgeable about all these signs and symptoms so they will do a lot of research. Uh, so that they can s answer the right questions and display the right sort of symptoms. Um, fictitious illness by proxy or Munchausen syndrome by proxy uh, occurs when uh, perhaps a mother uh, inflicts an illness on a child um, or may smother a child and uh, right at the brink of death uh, stop and resuscitate them and and then they're the hero for resuscitating their sick child or they're perceived as, as being a, a wonderful mother for caring for their um, sick or ill child. Get a lot of attention that way. Uh, malingering is faking an illness uh, for tangible gain. Uh, fictitious disorder and malingering, uh, it's usually due to lack of emotional c care. Um, which uh, they may not have received early in childhood. Um, as far as epidemiology and demographics, uh, you know, it's hard to say where this occurs and in who this occurs. Patients are very uh, mobile. Uh, they assume uh, several aliases, aliases so as not to be uh, discovered. But the history and physical findings is uh, they'll, they'll have multiple symptoms and they'll go to extreme lengths to produce the physical signs. Uh, of um, of their disease, uh, you know, putting stuff in their eyes to make their eyes water, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, differential diagnosis, they actually could have a medical illness. Uh, they could be suffering from a somatoform disorder as well. Um, and it's important that, you know, if you suspect this Munchausen syndrome by proxy um, or you suspect malingering, uh, don't confront the patient about um, faking their symptoms. Um, but do discreetly inform the physician of your suspicions. Eating disorders uh, include things like anorexia nervosa, which is a distorted body image. Um, it's very drastic. Uh, uh, the patient um, doesn't eat uh, in an intentional uh, weight loss. So by not eating or uh, not eating at all, uh, you know, they may weigh 90 pounds and they look in a mirror and they see themselves as this 300 pound person and they just quit eating. Uh, bulimia nervosa is a little bit different. They eat, uh, 
but they will often gorge themselves and then go purge their food after they're done eating uh, so that they know that they satisfy the hunger um, but then they vomit uh, to um, uh, to get rid of the calories. Um, the etiology of eating disorders, it's a brain chemistry structure abnormality. Um, patients uh, are frightful, they, they feel helpless, uh, they may lack self-control, uh, they may be uh, required, or they may be in um, uh, independent. Uh, bulimia uh, is an imbalance of brain neurotransmitters. Um, and these things could be, you know, affected by mood or anxiety disorders or mood orders and anxiety disorders may go hand in hand with uh, bulimia and um, uh, bulimia and anorexia. As far as history or physical findings, because they aren't getting their caloric intake, uh, they become malnourished, uh, they're hyperactive, uh, they have delayed onset of menstruation, GI problems, dehydration, hypertension, bradycardia, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, uh, Lanugo is something that may occur in uh, severe cases where they grow these fine white hairs that you see on newborn babies. Um, they may have a flat affect, uh, they may uh, have psychomotor retardation. Uh, with bulimia, they may have tooth decay as well because of the, uh, the acids in the stomach uh, from constantly vomiting uh, affect and decay the teeth. Differential diagnosis, maybe brain abscess, cancer, major depression disorders, anxiety disorders, AIDS. Therapeutic interventions is to treat their symptoms um, that they are experiencing. Uh, avoid confrontation um, and let the family know that this is an abnormal brain function. Uh, it is, a, again, a psychiatric disorder. It's a mental illness, uh, much like um, diabetes is an illness or COPD is an illness. Personality disorders, there's cluster A. Personality disorders where a patient is odd and eccentric. Um, you know, as um, We'll talk about the um, description, they're odd, they're eccentric, and the etiology and epidemiology and demographics, history and physical findings, um, e odd and eccentric. Uh, not sure if they're going to go into the differential diagnosis and therapeutic interventions for this. Yes, they are. Uh, the description and the definition uh, is they're odd, they're eccentric, uh, they may have paranoid personality disorder, they may have schizoid personality disorder, they may have uh, schizotypical personality disorder. As far as the etiology goes, it's very similar to schizophrenia. Um, as far as epidemiology and demographics, 3% um, um, of uh, the population may have a cluster A disorder. Uh, schizotypical personality is most common. Uh, as far as historical, history and physical findings, uh, the patient is emotionless, uh, they may have blunt effect, they may be suffering from delusions, hallucinations, differential diagnosis, could be schizophrenia, major depression, avoidant personality disorder, or borderline personality disorder. Therapeutic interventions, again, don't challenge the patient, explain the medical diagnosis, explain the procedures in a clear and plain language, treat their symptoms. Cluster B emotional disorders uh, include impulsive, unpredictable label. Uh, they may uh, uh, feed on emotional drama. Um, they may have uh, histrionic uh, personality disorder where they're the center of attention, uh, borderline personality disorder, rapid move shifts. They'll do anything um, to avoid abandonment. Uh, antisocial personality disorder. Uh, we often think of uh, somebody who's antisocial as somebody who doesn't want anything to do with anybody, and that's that's not true. An antisocial personality disorder is a person who lacks the ability to sympathize. Um, they care for uh, certainly only themselves and have no regard to anybody else. Um, they often are rule breakers. Uh, they don't need to follow any rules, those sort of things. Uh, narcissistic personality disorder, that's where the person feels that they're better than everyone else. Cluster B, as far as epidemiologic and demographics, 10 to 15 percent of uh, psychiatric disorders are cl cluster B, um, are, are histrionic. Uh, 
borderline disorders are more prominent in women, uh, often goes hand in hand with substance abuse and alcohol, and the etiology is unknown. Uh, as far as history and physical findings, for histrionic, they're going to be flirtur flirtatious. Uh, they may have conversion disorder symptoms. Uh, for borderline, they're going to lack emotional control. They're going to be angry. They may injure themselves, may be suicidal. Uh, and uh, they are unable to form close relationships. Um, as far as cluster B emotional uh, and dramatic disorders, the differential diagnosis could be mild bipolar, bipolar, atypical depression, substance abuse, and interventions when you have a patient like this is to manage the self-destruction. Uh, lithium and anti-epileptic drugs like carbamazepine, uh, carbamazepine uh, are given. Uh, valpuric acid uh, is another one that certainly could be given. Uh, and then psychotherapy. Cluster C, uh, these are anxious and fearful people. Um, description, they, they have a crippling shyness uh, around people. They're extremely anxious. Uh, they have an avoidant personality disorder. Uh, they have a dependent personality disorder, an excessive constant need to be taken care of, uh, and they may have an obsessive compulsive personality disorder, uh, or OCD. I like to say CDO because I like all things in order. Cluster C, um, the, the etiology, it could be genetic. As far as epidemiology and demographics, uh, half to 1% of the population has some sort of cluster C disorder. Um, being avoidant. Uh, depression, anxiety coexist with these. And as far as your history and physical findings, um, the patient's going to be dependent uh, or submissive, uh, compulsive, loss of control. Uh, differential diagnosis could be anxiety disorders, major depression, OCD, and your therapeutic in interventions is, as with any patient who is uh, depressed, who is uh, frightened, uh, is to be very reassuring and to comfort. A uh, suicidal patient and self-injury, as far as the epidemiology and demographics, 10% of the population considers suicide, 0.3% attempt suicide, 3-10% to 10 of those are teenagers, and about 4% uh, in the adult population uh, uh, goes as far as self-injury. Uh, risk factors, if they've had a previous attempt, uh, they may repeat it in the next one to two years. If they suffer from mood disorders, they're at higher risk, uh, certainly uh, drugs and alcohol or chronic terminal illness. If somebody knows they're going to die and know that that death may be painful, uh, they may end their life before that occurs. As far as the assessment, uh, you want to ask about uh, suicidal and homicidal thoughts. You want your questions to be very direct and very open. Management, consider the patient uh, whether or not they would uh, escalate and become violent. Um, stay away, wait for police. Um, if they've got a life threatening problem as a result of their attempting suicide, certainly you uh, are going to address that. Uh, if they uh, took medications that uh, would, uh, uh, you know, um, opioids or sedatives, if they overdosed on something like that, they would have respiratory depression and failure, so you'd need to support their breathing and ventilation. Um, li respect, listen, and um, uh, to the patient, uh, their reasons for ending their life are very real and, and very powerful to them. Um, and as a, a provider, whether we agree or disagree with their reasoning or their rationale, uh, we certainly have a legal obligation to ensure proper treatment and an ethical obligation to uh, treat the sick and injured. Impulse control disorders, uh, that's the failure to resist an impulse, uh, drive or temptation to perform harmful acts to self or others. Um, when they do, they have an increased arousal or excitement and tension before the impulsive act, then a sense of release or pleasure after the act. Um, Impulse control disorders include pathological gambling, and this is where a, uh, uh, a person's uh, gambling is persistent and reoccurrent and interferes with normal life functions. Uh, it's seen in, in people with high stress and high energy levels. Um, they neglect their f financial obligations, they embezzle money, they exploit relationships uh, in order to finance their gambling. Um, 
the phases of uh, an impulse disorder, pathological gambling impulse disorder. Um, they're winning, uh, and then they lose, and then they go to desperation, and then hopelessness. History, five or more of the following characteristics are seen in patients who suffer from pathological gambling. They lie to conceal their gambling habit. Uh, they increase frequency, they increase funds uh, to gamble, to increase the excitement. Um, they're anxious and irritable when they can't gamble. Uh, they escape from life's problems by gambling. Uh, they steal money to support their habit. They ignore uh, their other financial obligations. Uh, they borrow money from friends and family. And uh, even if it means jeopardizing family or work, um, they don't uh, they don't take that into account some differential diagnosis uh, social gambling uh, we know that people certainly can gamble socially without any sort of uh, ear uh, uh, any sort of uh, effect on their normal life uh, manic episode may also mimic uh, somebody with a pathological gambling uh, problem uh, who is in that manic stage or the anxiety stage, antisocial, narcissistic personality disorders. Therapeutic intervention is to recognize, recognize it, accept that they have a gambling counsel, that they have a gambling problem, and then receive uh, psychological counseling. Kleptomania, of course, is the recurrent compulsive uh, need to steal. The etiology and the epidemiology, uh, kleptomania is rare. Uh, they believe it to be a serotonin level. It is more common in women. Uh, as far as a history, they may have a long history of theft, uh, possible multiple convictions of theft. Um, again, tension, arousal before the theft, and then a release of that tension and pleasure after the theft. And uh, certainly they don't do it for financial gain. Uh, they do it for the, uh, the fact of getting away with it. Some differential diagnosis for kleptomania, manic episodes, antisocial personality disorders, conduct disorders. Um, maybe they're just an ordinary criminal uh, or delusional acts where they think that uh, you know, they don't have to pay for it. It's theirs. They deserve it, so they're just going to take it. Therapeutic intervention, like with all disorders, uh, begins with recognizing that you have a problem, accepting the problem, and then uh, psychosocial um, therapy. Uh, trichotillomania, uh, that's the habitual hair pulling, uh, and in that situation you'll see uh, noticeable hair loss. It may be part of an obsessive compulsive disorder. As far as etiology and epidemiology go, it's more common in women, um, where they may pick at the skin of their scalps, their eyebrows, or their eyelashes. Again, a, a tension relief sensation when they do that. History, these people are under distress. Um, they may have um, normal life function impairment as a result of their uh, trichotillomania. Uh, differential diagnosis is alopecia. Alopecia is a natural thinning of the hair or baldness in women uh, that occurs naturally. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, Munchausen syndrome, uh, therapeutic intervention is to modify their behavior uh, and to reverse their habit. Uh, intermittent explosive disorder, uh, these are patients who intermittently explode. Um, they just uh, have a, a, a sudden outburst of very violent physical activity. Uh, so you need to make sure the scene is safe. Um, the patient uh, will have recurrent violent and aggressive outbursts that are grossly out of proportion uh, in response to what caused it. Uh, even the slightest things uh, send them uh, into orbit. Uh, most result from uh, physical assaults um, in uh, individuals, physical assaults uh, on animals, physical assaults uh, in property destruction, or that wouldn't be physical, but property destroying, destroying of things. Uh, etiology and epidemiology, um, there's a disproportionate aggression uh, and loss of control more common in males. It, uh, they do not accept responsibility for their action. Uh, they always blame the victim. It wasn't their fault. It was whatever it was that set them off. Uh, they'll have a history of physical or verbal aggression towards people or animals or destroying property. And it occurs two times per week uh, in a month. Um, that's not how often it 
it occurs, but certainly that would be an indication that they may have impulsive control disorder or a, an explosive control disorder. Uh, intermittent explosive disorder, the differential diagnosis, head trauma, dementia, personality disorders, conduct disorders, and the psychotic disorder. Treatment, make sure you're safe. Uh, the patient may have suffered some traumatic injuries as a result of their outburst. Um, they need psychiatric counseling. They need mood stabilizers and antidepressant medications. Pyromania is a uh, repeated intentional fire setting. Etiology and epidemiology, it's more common in male children. Uh, it's episodic. Uh, they must set two or more destructive fires in order to be considered a pyromaniac. Um, they may suffer from poor social skills, um, dysfunctional parent relationship, um, uh, their history, uh, intentional fire setting of two or more times. Uh, again, that tension and excitement before the event and then pleasure and relief and gratification after starting the fire. Um, they have an obsession or a preoccupation with fire. Um, they're not set for monetary gain. They're not set for personal profit or vengeance or curiosity or to hide a crime. Uh, these patients have poor relationships with their parents, they have poor social skills, poor learning ability, and may suffer with emotional difficulties and other disorders. Differential diagnosis, childhood curiosity, arson, malicious intent, and then other psychological disorders um, as well. Uh, therapeutic intervention, certainly if they get burned uh, in, in the, um, uh, while setting the fire, then uh, we would need to um, treat those burns. Um, as far as the principles of behavior emergency management, patients' rights and expectations, um, requires your observation, your evaluation, your emotional support during their behavioral emergency, uh, requires your respect and attention, Again, this is a illness. Well, it's hard for us to understand because we don't see it. It's not like an asthma attack. Um, you know, their symptoms are so varied and there are so many different behavioral emergencies. Um, but when they have been diagnosed with one, uh, certainly uh, we need to respect that diagnosis and uh, and uh, give the patient the attention that they deserve. Uh, maybe privately question them about their mental illness, uh, so that, as they may not want to dis, um, uh, they may not want to talk about it in front of other people. Um, as far as verbal restraint, um, your verbal restraint, uh, especially if they're screaming obscenities at you or pushing buttons and trying to get you uh, upset as well. Um, your voice tone uh, certainly can cause them more anger, more angst. So don't raise your voice. Uh, don't get into a shouting match with them. Uh, don't challenge them because uh, certainly that's not going to end well. Be businesslike. Be courteous. Listen. Uh, don't take insults personally. Uh, many of these patients aren't aware of their actions. Don't leave the patient alone. Um, as far as involuntary transport and patient restraint, verbal restraint comes first. Uh, just asking the patient to um, lie down on the cot, asking the patient to allow you to, to transport them, uh, asking them uh, to settle down, that sort of stuff. Uh, if that doesn't work, then certainly you might have to rely on physical restraints and then once physically restrained, using chemical restraints as a last resort. Um, Restraints, uh, you should have law, uh, law enforcement present. And unfortunately, in some of these uh, psychiatric disorders, if the patient is uh, agitated to the point where they're uh, certainly uh, uh, could cause harm to themselves or you, um, oftentimes they're not in their right mind. So uh, even though you give them uh, orders, um, you know, they don't hear what you're saying. All they hear is the tone and the cadence of your voice. And, and depending on your tone and cadence, uh, you may, you know, accelerate their anxiety even more or their outburst even more. And these patients end up getting tased. 
um, have a plan. Uh, if you have to um, restrain, physically restrain a person, uh, you need at least five people available to do that. Uh, designate a team leader. The team leader will do all the coordination. The team leader will um, do all the speaking to the patient. Nobody else will speak to them, just the team leader. Uh, the team leader will maintain all con eye contact with the patient. It's important that the other four um, you know, don't have eye contact with the patient, don't stare them down, uh, those sort of things. Um, you need to have uh, standard precautions, gloves, that sort of stuff, proper equipment available to do the restraint. Um, we don't use police handcuffs. We certainly can use soft restraints. We don't use zip ties. Uh, and then explain why transporting the person against their will. Uh, offer them an opportunity for a voluntary transport. And if they turn it down, uh, then you have to let them know that you're going to have to physically uh, restrain them and take them to the hospital. You want to restrain them to a backboard um, just as a, a, a way to move them from point A to point B. And the reason we want them on a board or some sort of device is that should they start to vomit and they're restrained to the cot, you can't tip the cot on its side. Uh, oftentimes if you put one wrist above the head and the other down by the hips, uh, secure the legs with a seat belt across the thighs and just above the knees. Uh, if they're spitters, uh, you can put a non-rebreather or a surgical mask on them to prevent them from spitting. Uh, and you should be able to get at least one finger uh, beneath the restraint. You don't want it so tight that uh, they can't uh, take a breath or um, that it impedes circulation. Um, physically restrained patients should be chemically restrained with uh, you know some sort of benzodiazepine or some sort of butyrophenone. Um, monitor their respiratory rate, their pulse oximetry, their, their uh, mental status, and their uh, ECG. Restraint asphyxia occurs when the patient is unable to expand their chest and create a negative lung pressure for inspiration. Uh, it's usually the result of positional asphyxia. Uh, it's where you have a patient on their belly and you have people uh, leaning on them. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're kneeling on a patient's back and they're flat on the floor on their belly, uh, they're unable to uh, take a breath. Um, and patients who are hogtied tie their ankles to their wrists, leave them on their belly, um, then um, uh, they can um, suffer as, asphyxia. Uh, they could just because they can't take a breath. Um, As far as the epidemiology and demographics, there's been 142 asphyxial deaths in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, we've, we've had some recently in, in um, the news um, with uh, Eric Garner uh, and uh, the uh, chokehold uh, in which he suffered an asphyxial death. Uh, history and physical findings, uh, these patients go into uh, systole. Uh, they quit breathing within minutes. Uh, there is a struggle, they become very quiet, they arrest, and rarely are any of them uh, resuscitated. Uh, differential diagnosis would include a suicide attempt, excited delirium, uh, complications from an unknown medical condition, an overdose or an adverse drug effects or an intoxication with alcohol. Therapeutic invent intervention is to prevent from being in the um, having them in the hobble position, uh, never leave them prone, flat on their belly, uh, get them over onto their side as soon as you can. Uh, here is a example of uh, restraints with handcuffs. Their wrists are uh, handcuffed behind their back and the uh, cot restraints are used to uh, keep them restrained to the cot. Uh, here's one where the head is, um, uh, one arm is above the head and one arm is uh, tied to the cot down by the uh, wrist. It's important that you're showing there they can get at least one finger in there. Uh, that's not enough space to get the hand out. Um, but also importantly, you need to tie those restraints so that with one pull they can come undone. 
this is that hobble position that they talked about, uh, leaving them prone, flat on your belly. Uh, it's difficult for most of us who are healthy to lie flat on our belly and sing happy birthday to yourself. Uh, try doing that with your arms raised up and your feet raised up off the ground and all your weight on your on your uh, on your belly and your chest. Let alone having people kneeling on top of you and trying to breathe as well. All right. So with that, that that uh, concludes uh, part um, one of the psychiatric disorders, and uh, we'll pick up part two soon, uh, which will include uh, substance abuse.